Friday Night with Dean Aldridge, sponsored by Mrs. C.A. Cakes. Hi, I'm Samuel Evanson. I'm Leslie Williams. I'm Dave Morris, aka Dan the Driller. I'm Ryan Jackson. And this is Friday, Friday Night, Night with Dean Aldridge. Aldridge. So the Friday night with Dean Aldridge. Thank you if you've come back from last week. What a show we had. To open the show tonight, it's Mr. Samuel Evanson with his new song, Smoke and Mirrors. Every night, dream of fame. I know you, don't you know my name? Know my name. If you make it real, I'll make a deal. All you need to do is make me feel. First guest tonight is UK weightlifting champion Dave Morris. Dave, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for inviting me. Brilliant. Tell, tell us a little bit about your championships, mate. I mean, there's a lot. <laughs> well, <laughs> to be honest with you, it, it all started with um, in my old gym, and there, we used to we had this thing up where if you did a certain bench press, if you did the 300 bench press, you got a T-shirt with the 300 club on, 400 club on. But no one had done the 500, so I made it a goal to get to 500 and I did it just before New Year's Eve 2017 and I thought right I'm going to enter a strongman comp and I asked my wife and my kids what we thought about it do you think I should do it and they said yeah yeah so next morning I went to sign up all the places had gone so I thought what else can I do and I seen this bench only competition in real so I went into that and I won it and I set the new British record and uh, and then I got invited to Body Power for the British Finals and I beat the record twice in that then as well. And it just went on from there really. And it's just a, such a friendly bunch of people that take part in it. it you know, how many other sports is it where there's people you're competing against and they're actually cheering you on as well? You know, they want you to get the lift yeah. and you, you're competing against them. And it's really took off from there. And um, I remember when I first started out because it's some of it can be a bit expensive, you know, the mm. competition entries travel hotels if it's a distance and stuff like that and sometimes you're doing it international as well you know we've been to france finland we've been over to ireland we've got portugal later this year uh, all going well and and then all of a sudden sponsors just started coming up out of the woodwork and i just thought 
you know, to, to me, I was just a middle-aged big bloke from Witness, like, you know, and he liked to pick things up and drop them down again, you know, that's, so, I, you know, how's it got to this, but it's, I'm really enjoying it, really enjoying it. You're absolutely smashing it, mate, so you've held a couple of world records as well. Yeah, I've got the, um, it's a funny story, that, what had happened was I was aiming to do, I'd been doing bench only, I planned to do it that for my first year, and then in 2018 I'd had deadlift, but I've seen this competition come up in real, the same place where I did my first bench comp. And the record was five years old. It was 307.5 kilo. Mm. And the next day after that competition was my daughter's 21st birthday. So I made a promise to her that I'd get the world record for her. And I got 308. And it just felt really easy. So you put 320 on the bar and I got that as well. So And it's still That's held to this day, the IPL world record. Is it, yeah? yeah. 320. 320 kilo. Oh my God. 705 pounds. Mate, I struggle sometimes carrying three tins of beans, but you're absolutely <laughs> smashing that. So is this something you've always been interested in? Like, what, when you were, like, growing up, was it like, that's what I want to do? I tried it when I was younger. I remember walking into a gym at ten and a half stone, ringing wet, and one of the guys, you might know him, anyway, Mike Hearn, he's, he's six foot five, I think he was. He mm. walked out 23 stone, and there's me looking at him, six foot two, like, ten stone, ringing wet, and I thought, I want to be as big as you one day. And, and I remember the, the, the guys in the gym just started laughing, like, you know, I can't blame them really, you know what I mean, they look like a stick insect, and, um, you know, now I think now I'm about four stone heavier than him now, so really? six foot three, yeah, 27 stone now, and uh, I thought I want to do it, I want to do it, and then, you know, life, like, it takes you off on little meanders and stuff like that, and I just didn't really bother with the gym for a long time, and then I think I was 29, I got into martial arts then, mm. I did that, become British champion in that and then went over to America what did you, what did you compete in? I did the um, the BCC MA um, competition down in Milton Keynes yeah. mixed martial arts it was kind of like semi-contact so you had to wear the pads you had to have yeah, the chest yeah. pads. Now, people were still going on with broken feet and, and black eyes and that like I know because I was one of them and <laughs> <laughs> but I won my won first ever comp and then we went over to the George Ho tournament on the Whittle I was down to fight five guys there and when I turned up, the other four dropped out. I bet he did. So <laughs> I was fighting at 20 stone 8 at the time. And, um, and then we went over to America. We fought in America as well. I'm not being funny or nothing, Dave. If I came home and you were sat on my couch with, me, <laughs> with your arm now, my missus, I'd probably do you a cup of tea and a bacon butt tea. <laughs> I'd, I'd tell you what, I don't blame them lads from running whatsoever. So obviously on your social media, I've sort of picture of you and... I'm guessing it's before you actually got serious about yeah. it, but yeah. you were actually you were lighter then, but you looked more out of shape. Was, you, yeah, yeah well, it was like a big blueberry to be honest. <laughs> um, it's a bit of a personal story, but I'm, I'm on it. I've always been honest with people about it. What yeah. had happened was uh, 2007. I'd got myself um, into a bit of trouble, and I ended up uh, having, as I said, defended myself a little bit too well, and I ended up getting sent down. It was my first ever offence with the police. Uh, five years I got sentenced to because the lad was pretty hurt, which, you know. Um, and I got sent down. And, uh, it kind of changed me. Two and a half years inside, it changes you. And, you know, you get used to being on your own. I remember I come out and nearly split me and the missus up and everything else because we just, like, it was two different people. Um, but we, we sorted everything out and, you know, we got our, got our shit together, so to speak. And, uh, you know, we, we worked through it and everything else. But I was still very very socially anxious about going places i felt very aware that people were looking at me and yeah. even if he wasn't i just felt like he was all the time and uh, i got into bad eating habits and everything else um i started even started drinking more as you should just to you know have a few drinks in the, in the in the house not in the pubs and that and uh kept myself to myself i was like a little hermit and i just ended up just blowing out and blowing out and blowing out i become diabetic and everything else and um, I just thought, you know, if I don't do, I actually thought at one point, I just thought, this is gonna kill me. Mm. I, I, if I carry on like this, I'm gonna die. And I think at that point, I just thought, what would be, would be like. And then my daughter come back one day and she said, dad, I, I want to start the gym. And I'd already made a couple of attempts to try and get back into the gym because in 2006 I was bodybuilding, yeah. 2004 to 2006 I was bodybuilding, I'd done a few comps in that, done okay in them. 
but being inside, we still had a gym inside in prison and everything else, but I just couldn't quite get my head around things. And then I had to change again when I got back outside, you know, what we call Civvy Street. And I just, I just couldn't get it together. And then my daughter said, I need to go to the gym. And I said, okay, well, do you want me to drop you off and pick you up? And she said, no, I need a training partner. Now, it's very easy to let yourself down, but it's a it's a whole different world when your daughter asks you to do mm -hmm. something, isn't it? You know yourself, you've got, you've got kids yourself. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for my daughter asking, I genuinely believe to this, I wouldn't be, you know. Yeah, Because uh, I was that bad with, I really was bad with my health at that time. You know, uh, up, I mean, I was smoking up and smoking 20, 30 a day up until I was, until 2012. Mm. I switched over to vapes, never had a cough since. And, um, so everything changed, I got myself fitter and I didn't have a direction that I wanted to particularly go in, I just wanted to be better, I just wanted to live a bit longer. You know, I started getting that zest for life back, you know. And... And this, I mean, the shape you're in now, it's majority muscle in it. It's yeah, I mean, I've, st I've still got my power belly and everything else, you know. And, you know, I, I call it a fuel tank for a sex machine, but, you know, people don't believe me. <laughs> Sorry, non. Especially the wife. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's. Um, I'll still have that. I mean, but what I like is, is when I was bodybuilding, I'd got myself to, from 2004 to 2005, 2006, I'd got myself to 22 stone 10. And then when I decided to do this competition after seeing one of my friends compete in 2005, yeah. I said, I want to compete next year. And one of the fellas at the gym said, you'll never do that. And the exact term was, you'll never do that, you fat bastard. So, and that drove me onto it. Bless him, it's Dave, Dave Langley, rest in peace. He, he was a lovely guy. And um, I made it mission to do it then. I was so determined yeah. to do it. And I lost 80 pound in 22 weeks. And I competed at 17 stone on stage. And then I did another show later on the Staffs Open. And then I did Mr. England. And then it was a year after, I'll take a year off the book up, but then I got sent down the year after. Mm. So everything just changed. All my plans just went up in the air. And it was my own fault. You know, I'm, not, I'm certainly not a victim. It was something that was at my, my, my control. And you know, I'd lost control of it myself. Mm -hmm. But um, you're a better man now for it. Oh, I feel a lot better for it. I feel a lot better for it. I, I, I always believe, and I say this to me kids: Look, you are going to make mistakes in life, no matter how perfect you're trying to be. You are going to make mistakes in life. Just make sure they're the ones you learn from, because then you can pass it on to other people. Say, going through it like you do. Yeah, you know. 100%. But Dave Langley came up to me straight after that show, and he said to me, he said, uh, he said "Well done, Dave." I said, oh, "I'm not such a fat bastard now, am I?" He said, "I, he said, I knew that'd work." <laughs> bless him, God bless him. Brilliant. So when are you um, defending your titles? You've got a few days to defend. Yeah, I've got, uh, we're at the Pendulum Hotel in Manchester on the 24th of June. Um, I do both events then. Then we're in, that's for the British finals. Then we're at the Fit Expo at the docks. Right, okay. On the 4th of July, there's going to be power lifters, there's going to be strong men, there's going to be all kind of bodybuilding, everything, every strength event you can think of is going to be there. That's worth going to if, uh, and if anyone's uh, thinking a bit, a bit of entertainment that weekend. Um, then on August the 15th, I defend my European titles. And then it's the 18th and 19th of November in Portugal. That's where I defend my world titles. So, Thank you very much for sharing me. That was a good, uh, <laughs> it's a good chat. That I enjoyed that. Um, just uh, actually before we shoot, if you had any advice for people just starting off now, like when you when you found that you were starting in deadlift and stuff like that, how quickly was you progressing? Um, very very quickly because uh, like th there's certain things that you can and can't do. You can't use straps in a, in a power lifting. You can in a strongman competition, but you can't in a power lifting competition. Right. It's got to be, you know, and it's got to be a fluid motion. You can't like jerk it up the legs like you yeah, see yeah. some do, but in strongman you can do that. Um, and my grip was always with straps. So I had to get this grip strength from nowhere. So I just started developing it and it just went crazily strong in, in no time. I think I ended up doing 300 kilo double overhand. It's like the, the kind of grip you'd use for holding handlebars. Yeah. Um, and I pulled 300 kilo off the floor with that without straps, so it was just like pure grip. Um, and then it progressed on to mixed grip then, because what happens is when you've got the bar like that, it can roll out your hands. Just one slight movement, and it rolls out your hands. Mm. But if you've got a mixed grip, it can't roll anywhere. So that's usually the safest grip to use. So are you someone that people can come and train with or something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got me, I've got me coach qualifications. I've had um, uh, me per, me PT qualifications, me advanced nutrition. 
Uh, I've done all those uh, sports injuries and rehabilitation, all all level three and above. I uh, got them twelve years ago. Uh, the mad thing was, I went to put them into a proper use. I thought, right, okay, I'll get. My promise was, I'll get a world title, and then I'll come out proper doing the strength coaching and everything else. And I won two. That was in um, November two thousand nineteen. And then as soon as I started getting things off the ground, getting the ideas up, we had COVID, didn't we? Oh, so. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just starting to come out with it now. So I'm going to get this year out of the way and then I'm yeah. going to go full time on it after Christmas now. And, and, and your, e your Instagram is Damn the Gorilla. Damn the Gorilla. The Gorilla. What Damn the Gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. We have to think of something, saying it. We have to think of something <laughs> because every time I put in, when I tried to find a name, it was like Dave the Gorilla. No, nope, can't have that. <laughs> Dave the Gorilla 69. You definitely can't have that. That's definitely gone. <laughs> Um, and all these different things were coming. I just couldn't have it and then the only one that was together. offering was like Dave the Gorilla 16449734 I was like oh well listen thank you very much for coming on you've been a great guest mate thank you very much mate I nearly broke me hand then uh, <laughs> guys do you know what I was going to call him Dan the Gorilla then because he's just been saying it. it's Dave Morris guys thank you very much for coming on thank you, you take it easy cheers so my final guest of this season is Leslie Williams. Leslie's here to talk to us about a book that she's released. Um, it's about her daughter who sadly passed away. Um, Leslie, thank you for coming on. It's my pleasure. Oh, do you know what? The fact that you've come on means so much to me, Leslie. And obviously, this is Dominique, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, she was beautiful, Leslie, weren't she? Yeah. Life and soul of every party. What was she like as a person? Like, was she. Um, the I've got a lot of words for her, yeah. um, but I think the most important one is Earth Angel, because she was she was definitely sent here to help people because mm. that's all she ever did. Everyone who come across, she would bring waifs home, and I'd be like, oh damn, mum, please just let them stay tonight. And she was just that type of kid, and it didn't matter whether it was a boy or a girl, or she was never a threat to anybody. Yeah. She just always wanted to make people's lives better, and she did. A lot of the time, she was just amazing. Bad man. Um, so obviously, as you as I said, there you've released a book, daughter of mine. Do you want to tell us about it? Do you want to tell us yeah, the idea I, behind uh, writing it and stuff? Yeah. When I first lost her, <coughs> as you can imagine, it's just like I describe it in the book, and the best way I can describe it is it's like an earthquake. Mm. So you've got this lovely little family unit. So there was three kids, mum and dad. You know and I say in the book I'm an honest person I'm an open person you have your ups and downs every family does but we were great and it was lovely and we were just a house that was open boys our boys friends and Dom's friends we were never empty and that's how we liked it yeah. we even extended the house we could have more in it and um, so when we lost her it was just like the cracks from day one appeared in it. and that's why I always think it's like an earthquake yeah. it hits like me and her dad and then it hits the brothers, then a land and granddad, yeah. and it just goes on and on and on and on. And it's just like, it's like nothing you can describe. And it doesn't matter what child, you know, obviously Dom was our, like, she was our first born, first grandchild. So she was so special in every way. And so it was just uh, absolutely unbelievable. Behind and them, you're looking for ways to try and like, get through. Um, Cause you just think this is it, life's over. It's, it's silly things like why are those people walking past my window do they not know she's not here mm. you you do actually believe and it's weird because when I think back now I think I'm not a stupid woman why did I was like the world should have stopped I couldn't yeah. understand it I really couldn't understand it it's tough the morning um, process isn't it yeah it's, it's crazy it's and it's not like there was f so there was four of us in like left me a dad and her two brothers and we all grieve differently yeah there's no like right way wrong way and because me and her dad grieve so differently, it you know, the cracks show there mm. as well, and obviously the slots. But for me, I started writing poetry to help myself, and so I had done my grief journey through poems. Through writing poems? Yeah. Is that and what, I just, what the book's about? To, no, it's like, it's like in two halves. Oh, right, first okay. of all, I started drawing, so I illustrated the book as yeah. well. But then, like, the, so the first bit is, the first bit is to let you know about who Dominique was. Yeah. So just giving a brief uh, and about the boys because they had their own. Before we lost Dom, we had other. Liam was attacked and he's blind in one eye. That's her brother. Yeah. And then obviously this. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So it's like the journey a little bit. And then it's like being inside my head 
So, like, I had to prepare people because it's very raw. Mm. So I'm telling them from the morning she woke up to go to the news of it coming and yeah. then, like, right up into the funeral. This goes right up into the funeral, all the, like, what happened, what went on. And, um, and then at a funeral, there was, like, 800 people there. So it's... You know, it's over. It's it's just a day. So really just popular like, then, she yeah, she very, really very was. Too. Honestly, it was people from, you know, she went to uni, so everyone there loved her. Mm. She was always in town, so you know, she was a ma marvelous dancer. That's what she was doing: yeah. dance, performing art, physical theatre, and she just knew an array of people. And they just, honestly, I know my mum, and I know I sound, but don't, I've don't, never heard yeah, a bad word said about her, even like all this time later yeah. so 12 it's 12 years in august mm. 29th and there's still people now phone me i still get photos i've never seen um some people go god you're so lucky because people lose people and then that's that's it yeah, yeah. do you know what i mean and then we've got road piece as well so i speak at road i don't speak at road, i read poems at the road piece and that does help because yeah. road piece is amazing the woman who runs it pauline is just out of this world she's so supportive she lost her own son and that's why she went um, and started road peace in Liverpool and she's phenomenal we went um, two days after Dom died it was the Princess Diana memorial yeah. and we'd heard it but they said they were going to speak about Dom so I don't know why it was only two days late I said everyone we need to go there because we can't fit everyone in the house mm. the house was just like the front door was never closed yeah. so it was my mum was going oh my lord I was going mum I need them all in just let everyone in I can't cope on my own mm. and then she finally got it that it was the people yeah. that got us through and then when we went to road peace there was like I could just see a sea of people and they were all Dom's friends and I don't remember much after that like but it was still so the first bit is about Dom and then it goes into like the journey but there is hope in there as well it's not yeah. honestly it's not all a sad story no, there is hope in it as well because i tell about how well her, bo her brothers are doing yeah. which i thank god every day because it could have been that could have been a different story as well it was actually your, um, your mum who convinced to publish it weren't it yeah yeah, yeah. my lovely mum me rock um you know after dom obviously your life goes on a, a, a different journey than the one you ever imagined and me one constant was always my mum through everything it's been my mum mm -hmm. and then um she knew because my mum wrote poems as well and she'd wrote poems about Dom you know but obviously different yeah, yeah. um about her being little and all this and so I told her I had poems but then it was COVID wasn't it so because I have asthma I had to isolate and I live alone now right. so everyone was a little bit worried about yeah. me because in normal days I work in a school three days and I work in a kids home mm -hmm. so I just work like 50 hours a week I just work. that's what I thought I needed to do to cope with it yeah yeah I just never wanted to be but then Covid showed me that I didn't have to do all those hours mm. I could cope like by myself and yeah. it, it I kind of went on my own journey and I carried on with the poems and I've done Buddhism and I've done a teaching I've just done so many <laughs> courses because I love learning and then my mum said well why don't you put this book together it's all there you like so that's what I started yeah. doing. So last July, I showed it to my mum. Thank goodness I did. And she was just, I gave her his on the Friday tea time and she rang me six o'clock the next morning. She'd read the whole book and she went up and up all night. And she says, I can't believe the way you've written it. I'm so proud of you. And, um, <laughs> it's all right, don't apologise. Do not apologise. So I said to her, right, I'm going to get it published. And the last thing I do, I'm going to get it published. But then we lost my mum. Sorry. Don't, don't apologise, honestly. Take as much In time October. As to COVID. So that was another knock me sideways. I was mm. like, oh my God, we've got to bounce back up again. But um, I just, my mum, I just could hear her. I can still hear her now as she's in me here going back it in. <laughs> um, so my two sons were like, go on mum, now because I think they could see me slipping yeah. a bit I, I think when my mum went I think I lost my confidence because she was always there you can do this you got yeah, this yeah. just keep going and that and look after the boys that's they're the words I can hear and so um, I thought right so I worked on obviously it needs a tweak and like everything isn't it and um, I finally put it together and picked me cover the back and I thought right it's ready now so I sent it to a publisher and he was like yeah just publish it Les there's a niche you ready 
and he said there's a big niche out there for it because it covers yeah like especially now as well after the like everyone's gone through a lot of loss at the minute so I it mean, is. if this helps one person for that's a bit, what I said. it's all worth that's, it. Like that's, you know what I, mean? I think of our Dom as she used to say, Mum, if you can help one person, it, it's worth you being yeah. here. And I think, so because it's so raw and it's so like personal, I did question like who'd want to read it. Because you, you question yourself, don't you? Mm -hmm. And I was like, but then when it was published, he, he rang me and he went, right, it's on Amazon. And I was thinking, I never said put it on Amazon. <laughs> Starts a panic in the bin. I was thinking, oh, what, what am we're we gonna do? So then I rang my son. He went, "Mum, calm down. That's the whole point." I went, "But I don't know if I'm ready." And he went, "Mum, just stop it." Mm -hmm. He said, "I've just ordered it." So I was like, "All right, okay." Um, but then, like, it got reviews on Amazon, and, and obviously, people I don't know. There was a lot of people, obviously, who we do know. They all yeah. wanted to buy it, and I thought, "Now they're just going." Is it available anywhere there. else except Amazon? Yeah, it's Waterstones. Waterstones. There's a little local bookshop by my school where I work, Pritchard. Right, they sell okay. it. Um, there's a bookshop in town who want to do a book launch in August Brilliant. so it's just obviously you know you write it and then you've got to decide because yeah. the publisher said it's up to you you can publish it because my intention was to publish just have a copy for me mm. and if anyone wants that that was fine but then when you hear that it is actually helping people yeah. it goes a bit so I had to go for a heart thing scan the other way so I took one with me and said to the girl yeah I'll leave this in the hospital someone might like to read it so that's what I do when I go anywhere just I just leave one out. and then if someone and then there's a charity Love Jasmine um, they're marvellous as well they're for bereaved families and they do amazing but they're self funded so they've got um, a little unit up in Wavertree so I donated some for them mm. for families so they can um, it's just trying to help Oh, well, listen! Thank you, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for the. Uh, I mean, as you've touched on there, if it helps one person, not Leslie. Do you know what I mean? I know. So I hope. I'm it's sorry done. you've gone through what you've gone through, but I think that your story will touch many people. Do you know what I mean? She's amazing. I think she used to <laughs> set that dog off for a little laugh there in the background. I don't I don't know. Know she'd be here somewhere. Like, she'd be doing yeah, something. Can I was like, We've never had something the dog kitten off. I didn't even know there was a dog next door until that. I happened, was expecting so. something to happen, but I wasn't quite sure. I was just saying nothing. But listen, thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing oh, no, your story. Thank you for and having again, me. It's been lovely. Oh, it's just been amazing. Thank you for coming on. I like Leslie talking Williams, about guys. Thank you so much. Thanks. Now to end the show is the very talented Ryan Jackson. Make sure you support him. Thank you for watching the show and we'll be back soon. Take it easy. Ryan. Take my last regrets and just let it be. Oh, I sold another man's soul just to set him free. Yeah. Oh, that I have them will be revealed in time. Oh